somebody beat last night somewhere in, in my dream. I understood it, but I don't know. Okay. Good. Good. Oh, the way has gone away. Yeah. Okay. okay. So the answers to A and B the same. Question. How do you do number nine? I I got so lost. Okay. This is six point four. Six point nine? Yes. Yeah, the quotient one? No. Not the Find the mean invariance of S squared. Uh, S squared S, we assume that assume that X1 so this is the graph problem, Xn are independent oh. N U sigma squared. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And then you define S squared to be equal to 1 over n minus 1 summation xi minus x bar squared. i goes from 1 to n. Now we have a theorem. One of the theorems tells us that s squared times n minus 1 over sigma squared is chi squared of n minus 1 degrees of freedom. That's one of the theorems I'm going to quote. All right. For chi squared of n minus 1 degrees of freedom, is simply equal to z1 squared plus and so on plus z n minus 1 squared. The sum of squares of n minus 1, n zero, independent n0, 1. zi independent standard norm. Okay? So that's the, the distribution theory that we went through a little bit last time. That was theorem b. Page 197. Okay. Well, from there I should be able to do things, therefore. Therefore, S squared is sigma squared over n minus 1 times this chi square n minus 1. Now, all I need to do is be able to find the variance of that business. Okay. So the mean, e of s squared, is therefore equal to sigma squared over n minus 1 times the expected value of chi square n minus 1. Let's do that first. But what is the expected value of a chi square when variables? Okay, it's just equal to the number of degrees of freedom because the sigma squared over n minus 1 times the expected value of z1 squared plus and so on plus z n minus 1. So it's mu. Or what does it come out to be? What's the expected value of a z squared? E z squared is equal to the variance of z plus the mean of z, the quantity squared. The expectation of the square is just the variance when the mean is zero, in other words. So this is equal to sigma squared plus zero squared equals sigma squared. Yeah, mu squared? I'm sorry, one squared. What? Why the one? One, because I'm assuming z is independent zero. Z is uh, standard normal. Well, is that what chi squared is? Chi squared is the sum of squares of n minus one independent standard normals. So, oh, so it's not... Chi squared n minus one is this. So it's not... Normal with mean no, sigma. No, that's a non central business. Huh? You get a non central chi square if you put in a mean value in there. Uh, if you took if you had n mu one here, uh -huh. if you had mu, n mu one, then it would be uh, non central. So it's chi not square. There is such a thing as a non central chi square. So the question is the chi square is not based on uh, with uh, mu or sigma square? No. It's just standard normal. So I have to get rid of the mu and sigma squared first. The mu is obtained here, uh -huh. gotten rid of here by simply, because if I subtract mu from the xi uh -huh. and mu from the x bar, uh -huh. you get oh, it's the same as n mu sigma squared. So in other words, whether I put zero sigma squared, everything is, uh, I get the mu for free, in other words, in this s. Okay? So whether I have the mu there or there or not is true. Okay, it cancels. And the sigma squared is a scaling parameter. Okay. 
Okay, so I get sigma squared over n minus 1 times n minus 1 equals sigma squared for the expectation of s squared. That means s squared is unbiased for sigma squared. Okay. Capital S squared. And now because it is actually normal, so because I have this identity in the normal case, I can actually calculate the variance of s squared as well. In the normal case, I have that distributional identity. This is something we're not going to have in the current chapter, chapter 7. <laughs> okay, we're not going to be assuming any normality, whatever. So but we will still have a central limit there. We'll still have a central limit there, but we're not going to assume any normality of the underlying variables. So, um, to calculate the standard deviation, we've got to do expected value of s to the fourth? So I'll calculate the variance of s squared. It's not that hard, really, because of this identity here, where the variance of s squared is e s to the fourth minus e s squared squared. We just calculated the expected value of s yeah. squared. Okay, so that's a piece of cake. How do you calculate e s to the fourth? Well, that's the actually this is one way to do it, but this is the wrong way to do it. Okay? Because this is going to take you too far afield. Alright? So there's a trick. Yeah, the trick is to use the variance of a sum of independent. Variance of s squared is the variance of sigma squared over n minus 1 times z1 squared plus the sum plus z n minus 1 squared. How did you get. Oh, okay. Okay. Ah. Plugging in that identity. Okay which is sigma to the fourth over n minus one squared, times the variance of the sum of independent. The z's are independent, therefore the z squareds are independent. You have a sum of them. They're independent, the variances add. So this comes out to be, and they're all obviously the same, n minus one times the variance of z one squared. What's the variance of z one squared? You know, I just have to calculate the variance of the square of a normal. I told you last time the hint in the class was that is equal to 2. This is equal to 2. I hinted you. You should show it. If you didn't show it, I can still give you most of the credit for the problem. This equals 2. Okay? Maybe make that extra credit that that's equal to 2. Okay? Can I delay on homework? <laughs> a delay on homework. So there, you, so there you have it. Okay. So you have to that, that'll just count extra credit. The variance of z squared equals two. How do you do the variance of z squared? You just have there. You do go back to actually calculating because this is not a sum of independence or anything. I have to just basically say that's expectation of z to the fourth minus expectation of z squared squared. I calculate expectation of z squared. That's one. So this is expectation of z to the fourth minus 1, where z is standard normal. Now how do you calculate the uh, expectation of z to the fourth? Moment generating. Okay, take that z equal to m, the fourth derivative of the moment, of the moment generating function of the standard normal, it's 0 minus 1. Okay? Where m of t is equal to e to the t squared over 2. So you just have to do that calculation. Especially if you have a software to do it for you. <laughs> That would be easy with a ma uh, Maple or Mathematica or something like that. Or even MATLAB, I guess you could do this one simple computation without a worksheet. Okay? Okay. You could also use the moment generating function of the chi squared directly and do it this way if you wanted to. Um, you could use the chi squared moment generating function. Is actually a little bit nicer because it's it's a simpler moment generating function. Well, it's difficult to do. 
right? Well, yeah, but this one has a square, and so you have to use the product rule and so on and so forth. But with the chi square itself, chi square n, chi square n has moment generating function. Um, 1 over 1 minus 2t, I think, to the n over 2. Okay, is that correct? Let's see if I looked it up here. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So that I could actually, I put n here. I'll maybe just put nu here so that it's not going to be with that n. Nu over 2. Okay? So if I wanted to find, for example, the, uh, you know, I need to find the second moment of that. Alright? If I want to find the variance of chi squared, therefore, you already know the mean, right? This would be the second moment expectation of chi squared. This would be the what? The moment generating function of chi squared sub so nu, second derivative, then zero. Okay? Minus the first derivative is zero squared, but I already showed that, that the mean of chi squared and nu is nu. So it's nu squared. Okay? Nu is a. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm using nu instead of n. Here, just count degrees of freedom. Okay? Nu. Okay, in Greek. Okay? So, I like a, like a v. Some people like to make it a v. So, I can take two derivatives of that function, or these. Alright? So, this would be nu over 2. Well, I should write it as 1 minus 2t to the minus nu over 2. Okay, so that comes out to be minus nu over 2 times minus nu over 2 minus 1, and then there's two factors of 2, minus 2, that is. Okay. Right. This is the m double prime of 0 is equal to that, which comes out to be equal to nu. Times new How did that double prime? Minus 2. Did I just prime? Or, oh, uh, new plus 2. Okay. So therefore, the variance of chi square nu is equal to new squared plus 2 nu minus new squared equals 2 nu. So it's just twice the number of degrees of freedom. Easier than this. So, so the moment generating function in the end was the way to go. Okay. From the very beginning, just do it directly in chi square. Uh, why don't they just say chi square, not s square? Yeah. Well, you have to do the fiddling with s square in terms of chi square and all that. But yeah. Yeah, you do need s square in terms of oh, chi square. You have to use that implication. You can't just do it without it. Otherwise, you can't have the moment generating function of s squared. Or chi squared. All right? All right. Other questions about this homework? 7.1. How come I can't get it? 7.1, how come you can't get it the way it's supposed to be? Yes. The numbers actually, the, the numbers in the back of the book. I mean right, but I don't get the You right. couldn't get the variance? Yeah. yeah 2.34, whatever. Like a little bit, a teeny bit. Well, what was the what's the actual variance parameter? That might be the, the key there. What's the actual? Um, Are you did, sure we ain't got the right answer? One, two, two, four. Eight. What's the variance of the population? Did you get that right? I don't know. Okay. What's the variance of the population variance? Sigma for seven point one. Let's make sure we got that sigma squared. So you have a population one, two, oh. two, four, eight, right? Okay. The mean was 5 was 19, 17 divided by 5, uh -huh. 3.4, everybody got that, all right, what's sigma squared? The shortcut method is to 1 over 5, i goes from 1 to 5, x squared, uh, x i squared, minus the 3.4 squared, is 6.24, let's see, what does this come out to be? That's 6.24, okay, you got 6.24, that sounds pretty good, let's see, uh, 4 and 4 is 8, 16, 24, 64, 80, this is 
minus 289 over 25 equals 4511 is 156 over 25, which is 6.24. That sounds good. Okay. That's good. Okay. How did you do that in your head? Why I've already done it once on paper. Oh. <laughs> Oh, well, I that. That's what I don't do with problems. <laughs> I do have problems. <laughs> in my olden days, I might be able to get it that fast without doing the problem. <laughs> okay. Um, yes. Yes. Six point five. You can get six point five. You can multiply six by four. Okay. Plus, you had told me the answer, so it was easy. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> Magic. Now, you need to calculate all samples of size 2, right? Yeah. How many samples are there? Ordered samples, let's say, or unordered samples. For this, you only need unordered samples. So, slide to choose. There's 10 samples of size 2. 5, 6. 5 choose 2 equals 10. Unordered samples of size two. And I need to calculate um, all of those and calculate uh, the actual population, the variance of x bar, therefore. Okay? So then I have uh, 45. 5 choose 2? Oh, whoops. 5 choose 2. 5 choose 2. So I've got one, two, one, two. These these look like the same sample of size two, but I have to keep them because I have two twos. So one's a two star, and the other one's a two some double star. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the marked twos. All right. So here I'm just putting. These are the samples. One, two, one, two, one, three, two, one, four, one, eight. Do you need to have one one as well? No. Two four. No, because it's not. I sample without replacement. That's why it's combinations. Two four, two eight, and um, two two. I have to have though. Yeah. Because there's two different twos. That's the tricky part of it. I'm sorry. I have too many things here. Okay. So I'm trying to do. Two eight, and then I have um, four eight. eight. Four eight. One two three four five six seven. One four eight. eight. Uh, I forgot my two eight. I have two two eights too. That's what I have. Oh, you're gonna write down each one explicitly. What? A two two, a two four, and I have two two fours as well. Okay. Because there's double twos. Alright, then I have four eight. There's the ten cent. There's the ten I'm ordered ten. <coughs> there's two twos. So so I really need to mark the twos. That's why I made this problem a little bit hard. It's a star two and a double star two. Okay? So here's a, those are distinct points. This is a double star. Okay? This is a star. This is a double star. Here. This is a star, this is a double star. Okay. okay. So that's why I just that that's close to the sample. So now I need egg and I calculate the ten values of X bar. Uh -huh. And that's my population of X bar values. Okay? So if X bar equals, let's see, what are the possible values are? Three halves, three halves, those are the lowest, right? I have a five halves, I have a two though. Two. Five halves. Five halves is the next. Three. And I have two threes. These are the population values of x bar. Two threes. Then I have um, the next lowest is the uh, one eight, which is nine halves. Is that correct? That's four point five. Five. Right. Two eight gives me. I have two fives, and I have a six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now I'll do the same calculation we did up here, uh -huh. only with capital N equals to ten. Uh -huh. That gives you the sigma squared of x bar. 
the variance of x bar. Okay. So I had to find the mean. Well, we already know the mean is 17 fifths. Okay, I won't go through that. You can verify the mean of this. If I take the average these numbers, I get 17 ah. fifths. For average these numbers, e of x bar equals 17 fifths. Now you got to check. Same thing was average x bar equals 17 fifths. And sigma squared is of x bar. You were supposed to do it this way, right? You were also supposed to find the probability distribution of x bar, which in this case was obviously two tenths for three halves, one tenth here, one tenth here, two tenths for three, one tenth here, two tenths for five, one tenth here. Okay, so you can do it like that. Right, so this is giving you the probability distribution of x bar. Right. Okay, what's the probability? What I did was I used the probability distribution and then try to get the variance. Does that work? Yeah, you? it's the same. You can? Yeah, because it's going to be summation xi squared. Uh -huh. I goes from 1 to 10. x bar sub i squared, 1 to 10. Okay, uh -huh. minus 17 fifths of 1 to squared. Okay. So now I have to square all of these. Okay. Add them up. And I, when I do this, I get the 2.34. That is correct. <laughs> well, you have to add 3 halves squared twice, right? I mean, we can do it here. Uh, I'll put the little bar here to show that I'm squaring these numbers. Okay. Yeah, I can't. Huh. But if I use the probability density function, how would I do it? There's no density. It's a probability mass function. It's the same thing. Yeah. You would multiply this 3 halves squared by 2 tenths, instead of adding 3 halves squared twice and divided by 10. I take, I have just one, up, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. different values. Yeah. Seven values, but you don't divide by seven. seven. Oh, multiply by 2 tenths, you multiply by the probabilities. E of x squared would be the x squared times the probability, 2 tenths, not 2 sevenths. Oh, that's what I was doing wrong. Oh, divided by seven. Okay. Okay. Now okay. you got your point. Okay. Okay. So, so multiply by the probability, the prob actual probability. Uh. Okay. Okay. So x bar takes seven different values. But now with equal probabilities. Okay. You take each of these sort of marked values, three halves, three halves. Uh, there's just ten balls in an urn. Two of them are marked three halves. Two of them are marked three. Two of them are marked five. Uh, so you guys have made a trick. So basically, what we're doing is we're taking one urn model, the urn model X. Okay, you have an urn with five balls in it, they're numbered one, two, two, four, and eight, respectively. Okay. And then what I'm getting is a new urn model for the distribution of X bar. Okay, I've got ten balls in there. Okay. If you use ordered samples, you get twenty balls. Okay. But then you just get, you know, um, four with value of three halves, two with value of two. Be the same. It's the same distribution, exactly. Some question. For the variance, how come we don't divide by, like, 1 over 1 or something? Well, 1 over 9. Okay, because that's a sample variance. That's a sample variance. This is the exact population variance. In other words... How about we calculate okay. X bar is a random variable. X bar is a random variable. It has a variance. Mm -hmm. That's called the population variance. X is a random variable. I pick one of these numbers at random. Mm -hmm. I'm probably one fifth each. Mm -hmm. That random variable has a variance. That's called the population variance. Mm -hmm. You see this formula right here? This is exactly the formula for the variance of random variable. It takes five values with mm -hmm. probability one fifth each. Mm -hmm. The values may be repeated. Yeah, I know. Okay. Yeah. Okay? So this is just 
Uh, this is just 1 minus 3.4 squared times the probability one fifth plus 2 minus 3.4 squared times the probability one fifth plus and so on, which is e of x minus mu squared, where x has the distribution which is probability one fifth on each point, which is just the Ern model. So the Ern model uh, gives you the probability distribution of x. Five falls in Ern, you just draw one out. Okay? You don't know which one it is. Probably it's one fifth, it should be each of those values. One, two, two, four, or eight. So that population variance is just the variance of the random variable x. Where x is one pick from the Ern. Is that clear? I should write it down probably. Population variance. Equals the variance, the actual variance of x, where x equals xi with probability 1 over n, for each i goes from 1 to capital N. That's the case. Alright? So the little xi's were just the numbers on the marble. X I was the number on the height marble or height ball in the car. Okay. But when you calculated the other variance of x bar, why do you don't you do that by one over nine instead of one over ten? Because it's just another urn. It's just a, it's the actual variance. So what I have is I have a model. Each of these but values. It? No, I have but a model. I have samples. ten possible, ten possible x bars. Each probably one ten. But, but, That's the distribution of x bar. But it's a sample of two, right? Yeah, but and you're just confusing them. This is a random variable. I talk about a sample variance. That's a different thing. Okay? That's a different thing. What is a sample variance? Sample variance is an estimate of the population variance, of population variance sigma squared. Okay. Okay, and it is based on the samples and sample mean. Okay, so I would be subtracting x bar from the x i's. So I'd be subtracting three halves from one and three halves from two if my sample was one two. Okay. You actually just look at one of these points to calculate a sample variance. For each of these points, for each of these pairs, I calculate a sample variance. So then I can, then oh. I can talk about the distribution of the sample variance. So I could actually, I could talk about the distribution of the sample variance. So what do you mean? Like for this problem, what's the sample variance? One to little n. Okay. One by little n minus one. Okay. This is, this is. Uh, Actually, he doesn't. He's not using this either. And this, this is the capital S squared. And then in this chapter, he's going to throw that away. He's going to talk about sigma S squared. Then he's not going to throw it away. He's going to talk about another one. X i minus x bar squared. I goes one, two. Yeah. Okay. So let's look at this one. All right. Now, it's not actually unbiased for sigma squared because the variables are not independent. Okay? But let's see what it is. Because here, we have a si different situation. In simple random sampling, the variables are not, the variables x1 through xn are not independent. Okay, so let's have a look at what this is. Let's actually calculate the probability distribution of s squared. Okay? The probability distribution of s squared. It also has 10 values. What are they? Uh, S squared equals, and I'm going to have earned for that. So for each of those little things I had over there, each of those sample pairs, I need to calculate this. N is 2. N minus 1 and therefore 1. Okay, so I'm talking about 1 minus 3 half squared, and 1 minus 3, and 2 minus 3 half squared. So that's a half squared plus half squared. 
cardinal squared is a half. Half, a half. Okay? This one. Uh, what was the next one? This was the next one. That is uh, zero. Okay? Sam for me is two. Each of the values is two. Okay? Uh, this one, five halves. Sam for me is five halves. Uh, the values are one and four, so that's three halves squared, three halves squared. That's nine fourths, and nine fourths is nine halves. Okay, what was the next one in the order here? We were doing, we were doing these two. Okay, each of these has mean three. Sample mean three. Okay, these threes. That's what I'm subtracting off from each of them. The difference is one in each case, so one plus one is two. So it's two and two. Okay. Are you following me? What I'm doing here? Okay. The one, the eight. Okay. The mean was uh, 4.5, so it's 3.5 squared. Seven halves squared times two. 49 four cents is equal to 49 halves. And let's see the last two. <laughs> okay. The last three. That is the two eight two eight. The mean is five, so that's the difference is three. Three squared is nine times two is 18. So I'm dividing by just one here. M minus one is one. And then the four eight is a six. The mean, the difference is four. So the mean difference is two, which is four plus four is eight. And then the smaller sample variance. So those are the ten sample variances that I could get. Probability distribution is one tenth for each of these individuals, or two tenths here, and so on. So the expected value of s squared is just the average of these numbers. Which isn't going to be sigma squared here. Okay. Is that? No. Nope. It'll be a theorem for what the action value should be. So we'll do that too. Might as well do that one. Do that theorem as well. Let's just do it. Take the value of s squared is, I think we have h squared, s squared. Um, he's got the value of sigma, he's got the expected value of sigma hat squared. I'll just have to fix it up. Okay? This may be a homer problem, but this comes out to be, therefore, one ten times. I have to add all these up. That looks like a pretty easy or sum, right? It's pretty easy. A half, a one. <laughs> this is four and a half. Five and a half, nine and a half. And what's this? Nine and a half. And that's almost twenty-five, which is a half less. So this is twenty-five plus nine is thirty-four. 42, 60, 78, 7.8. Okay? According to theorem A, page 211, E of S squared equals, it would be um, 10 minus 1, let's see, what would it be? It would be N over N minus 1. Sigma hat squared, okay, which would be therefore n over n minus one times sigma squared times n minus one over n times capital n over n minus one. So these are going to cancel. It's a much nicer formula. Equals sigma squared times capital n over n minus one. So it's not un it's not biased unbiased for sigma squared because this bias capital uh, factor n over capital n over n minus one. So this would be. Therefore, sigma squared times six fifths, because capital N in my original population is five, not ten. All right? This capital N is the original population. So is 7.8 equal to six fifths or 6.24? Six. I know it's five. Ah, sorry, five fourths. Sorry. <laughs> five fourths, I can't oh, add yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Okay, so then just check it. Divide 4 into 6.24, that divides evenly, right? That's um, oh, 1.56. 1.56 times 5. It is 7.8. Times 5. Equals 7.8. So it checks. Okay? So I even checked another thing with this problem. Okay? Check another formula. Okay. So then, that, hopefully that's so that's not the variance of the. 
not the variance of this thing. Sigma squared of the population variance of x is 6.24. Yeah. Boy. Okay. Yeah. So you, from two samples, basically, what you're saying is you can't guess the value of this? Uh, from from, from, just, from just, 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 just picking the sample, then I'm getting, uh, you know, I get any one of these possible values. Okay? Uh-huh. And that's not really estimating the variance of 6.24 very well. Okay? Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, <laughs> go for 18, 25, uh, zero. Okay. <laughs> It's average, the average of all possibilities, if I did the sampling a whole bunch of times, you know. So the sample size, too, is not a very good, you don't get a very good estimate of sigma squared. Okay, it wouldn't be bad. It wouldn't even have that bad of a bias as if capital M would be large enough. Okay. But capital S squared is not unbiased sigma squared. Okay. Um, so you need a population correction to actually, um, you need to find a population correction to, to fix this, this estimator up, okay? Which is capital N minus one over capital N in this case. All right. So he introduces the sigma hat square just to screw up your mind in this chapter, <laughs> okay? All right? It's just a variant of capital S squared. All right? What? Yeah, what this is, is a this variant thing? of capital S squared. It's just divided by n instead of n minus 1. What's so sacred about the n minus 1? The n minus 1 is sacred in the uh, capital n equal infinity case because then you do get an unbiased estimator. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right? When capital N is infinity, this, this, this goes out. All right? Capital S very large. What? Yeah, what is What's that sigma squared? This bias isn't too bad since capital N is large anyway by assumption. So, so actually, we like this estimate. So the hat is. It just is just another notation. But how come it doesn't have Because you put the hat on to estimate the parameter sigma squared. Okay. But it doesn't have the n. So it's the biased. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is both of them are biased in the finite population case. He is just taking. I thought the top one is unbiased. It is when the sample is independent. A simple random sample is not independent. Because capital N is finite. When I sample without replacement from a finite arm, mm -hmm. the values I come up with successively are not independent. I don't get independent random variables. Okay. Oh. If I get a queen of hearts on the first draw, the chance that you get a queen of hearts on the second draw is zero. I get a commuter probability, right? It's not. It's not sampling with replacement. Sampling with replacement, I can get the queen of hearts on the first draw and on the second draw. Right? Because I just put the card back in, reshuffle it, and take off the top card. Okay. So sampling without replacement, that's what a simple random sample is. If capital is infinity, then it's then you then all the values are replenished infinitely. Okay. And I sample one out, it doesn't matter. So okay. it is all correlated. Is, there's a million other fish of the same size to take its place. Okay? So taking one fish out of the sea doesn't make any difference in that ideal situation. All right? Uh, then, then sampling without replacement is the same as sampling so, with replacement. So what? So what's the relationship between bottom one and the top one? It's just the n minus one. Yeah. The, yeah. That's the only difference. And so this the, is just a variant of this. And the variant of what? Variant. Yeah. Variant. Oh. A just just an alternative. Uh, alternative. No variance. Uh, oh. This is not. Okay, a variant, a variant, a different version okay. thereof. Okay. Ah. <laughs> all right. Oh. So we've covered a lot of ground here just by sort of going through all this junk. All right. There's a whole bunch of notations here. There's a whole bunch of things flying around. Try to keep. That's why we assign this problem to see if you can keep your mind straight about what is actually happening. That's the capital X's, the little X's, all the stuff. So all the Things are coming under the roof. All, all the, all the ghosts. Okay, in this subject. <laughs> it's very good to keep your focus on this one particular problem. All right. So why don't we go on from there? So hopefully.
hopefully you do that problem well. Do it again, maybe. I'll just put it on the test. <laughs> we have two and a half hours on a vital exam. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. Uh, you're, you're, they haven't been too bad. No, no. Okay, no. let's let's go to the next thing. Tina, you have a Are question? Do you have any questions? Are you going to give a um, practice before the final? Yeah. Okay. okay super random sampling. No, it is not. Ugh. Okay. So what is, one of the real questions is if they're not independent variables, how do you calculate the variance of the sum? That's a nasty thing, right? Variance of a so what's the covariance between x one and x two? Okay, maybe we should calculate that in this in this example. All right, let's just do let's take let's calculate everything in the book for this one example. Okay. 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 <laughs> what's the covariance between x one and x two? What's x one and what's x two? In this sample, x one. Well, you see. Is one and x two is two. Okay. In this sample, x one is two and x x one is one and x two is two. So, uh, really, I should look at um, ordered samples normally for this. Um, it's not going to make any difference because uh, they're going to come up with. So, how do I calculate covariance between x1 and x2? So, if I, so, I'm looking at all these possible samples, right? x, uh, well, I'm looking at, I pull out the first number from the urn, and I pull out the second number from the urn. Okay. And that's going to, of course, you know, and you can look at all the ordered samples. So maybe I should just do all the ordered samples. That's like one, two, two, one. And you'll see how it goes. We'll just write it all down, all 20 of them. Okay? There's a one, two, and a two, one again because there's two different twos. All right? Et cetera. And I'll just, I won't write them all down. I'm just basically doubling each of those over there. And the only reason that you would get a 2-2 two, two is because they're different twos. Otherwise, you never get the same. Okay? 2-2. Two, two. There's only, and then there's, um, there's another 2-2, two, two, because it's this 2 first, and then that's 2 second, or this 2 first, and that's 1 second. Okay? Et cetera. Maybe we should put the stars on it, two double stars, and some double stars, and then stop. Okay? Etc. So those are all the possible samples of size two. Now I'm talking about what's the covariance. Covariance is defined to be you're going to take the average one over the one over. This is going to be now one over the population of these numbers, okay? Which is just 20 of them, right? One over 20 times what you do is x. Um, 1, x2, and something like that. And then I'm going to have minus the uh, mu1 times mu2. Okay, but the mu1 and mu2 are the same. Okay, they're both equal to 3.4. Okay. And obviously, since each of these, since obviously the numbers are just repeated, I can write this as 1 over 10 times, but just take the product of these numbers. Okay? So in other words, it's expectation of x1, x2 minus, this is uh, the product of expectation, ex1, ex2. I should have maybe written this formula first. That's how I'm going to compute it. Okay? That's the definition of, one of the alternative definitions of covariance. So now, obviously, I don't need the ordered samples. I only need the unordered samples. Okay, so this is equal to one tenth. I had to take the product of the numbers. Okay, that's two, two, four, eight. I'm just going to go along these things. Two, two, four, eight, four, eight, eight, sixteen, sixteen, thirty-two. Minus 
minus a 17 fifths squared. Too bad either, right? What does it come out to be? Um, four and four is eight, sixteen, point twenty-eight, thirty-six, fifty-two, sixty-eight, one hundred. Right, get sleep. <laughs> Ten. <laughs> Chose these numbers. Let's get this again, both spoken. 17, that's 289 over 25 equals, it comes out to a negative number, it's 10 minus 25 into that, that's 250, and then what's, what's, it goes 275, right? 25 and 275 is 11, so this is 11, and then I have 14 over 25, which is 11.56. Okay. I didn't do that quite as fast. <laughs> Equals negative 1.56. That's the covariance between x1 and x2. What's the theory for what it should be? The theory is that it's negative sigma squared over capital N minus 1. There. The covariance between x1 and x2 is equal to this. A negative, it's a negative sequence squared over capital N minus 1. And that is... So, the covariance of a sample with x1 and x2, is that what it is? Yeah, uh, you're just taking oh, two. Uh, Actually, it doesn't matter how many you take. Think about it this way. Okay, this is a good question. Suppose I sample x1 and x2, and I continue, I just sample the rest of the three balls too. Yeah. I just forget about them. Okay? So this is the sample. Is it the, so whether you take a sample size 2 or a sample size 5, the variance between x1 and x2 is the same. Just forget about it, all right? I mean, I can have samples 5 long, right? 1, 2, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Okay. But I can just, obviously, I can just forget about those. Wow. Yeah, think about it a little bit. Because, um, because the ratio, because I'll still get x1, x2 will still just be you know, two and two, you know, with fact, you know, I'll get a bunch more tubes, okay, but a bunch more samples, right? So now, instead of just uh, 20 samples, we'll have, let's see, five times, I'll have 120 samples. Okay. So, basically, if you say... Five times four times three times three times, I'll have 120 samples, mm -hmm. okay, and here I only I have only counted the two twice, even though I had it four times with 20 samples, okay? One, two, three, four. Okay? Mm -hmm. Let me count it twice because I hit this ratio. I could just throw away the order. Okay? Because I think in the product x1, x2, mm -hmm. the order didn't matter. Right? Well, what? So now if I had 120, how many twos would I have? About 120 samples. You have just, again, just uh, I had two out of ten, that's one out of fifth. Okay? I had 24 twos out of 120. Okay. It's just you, everything we multiply it up, and the expectation of x1, x2 would be exactly the same. The expectation of x1 would be exactly the same, 17 fifths. Do I have to use all the samples in order to calculate the expectation of x1? No. I just take the smaller sample space. Yeah. What if you choose, like, well, if you sample three? We do have to think about these things. Well, my yeah, we have to roll these things through our mind and then sort of forget about them. The expected value of x1 is going to be 17 fifths no matter if I take all the five or just one. See what I'm saying? Is this, should that matter? Because it's just the first ball you take out. Yeah, it's just the first ball you take out. X1. Now, the question is, is what's the expected value of X5? But I think it's the same as X1. Yeah, it's right, but that's the symmetry. Okay? Uh, We're using the symmetry of the sample space. Okay? That if I had to calculate the expected value of x5, presumably, I mean, if I was going from first principles, I'd have to take all 120 samples of size 5, and then take the fifth 
coordinate, okay, and average them over the 120, okay? Average the fifth coordinate over the 120 sample points. 125 tuples, all right? I have 125 tuples, and I'll take the fifth coordinate and I'll average over those 120, right? So we'll just add 120 numbers to divide by 120. That'll be the fixed value of x5. Do I have to do that much more? No, because we have symmetry, all right? If I just take those five, those 120 five tuples and I reverse the order, okay, then x5 becomes x1, and I just, just forget about all the other four samples, okay? It's the same thing, all right? It's the, we're using the symmetry. What? Yeah. Make x5 equal to x1. In the same way, the covariance between x1 and x2 is the same as the covariance between x1 and x3. It's the same as x2 and x3. The same as x4 and x5. They're all the same. xi, xj. This is a harder thing to stomach. i unequal to j. <laughs> okay? That's using the symmetry of the sample space. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that would be awkward. <laughs> oh my god. How is this a shape? That just doesn't make sense. It's because you have less numbers in the earth. <laughs> because I can just permute the sample space. X4 and X5 become X1, X2. How can you do that, though? Okay. It doesn't make sense. Because the way you because Let's the way do you it. Order. Let's go ahead and do all the sample space. Okay? 120 and 140. You want to see all 120 of them? <laughs> no. <laughs> it takes too long. Okay, let's just do a couple. All right? Okay. This one is going to occur. Okay. But also, if I permute it, obviously by shuffling, you know, I can permute this thing. So I can get one. Um, let's focus on the one and the eight. One and eight. Uh, I just, let's just uh, change these two positions. So I go in and shuffle uh -huh. that way, okay? Okay? And so uh, I'm going to shuffle these. So I'm going to do these two positions. Oh, these two positions. I said one, four, two, two, eight, etc. Okay? Versus this. Okay? I can count all the sample points this way and keep going, all right? Or I can count them this way and keep going, okay? Now, um, I want to take the covariance between x1 and x3, all right? So I'm going to take these two numbers, okay, multiply, and average, right? You would believe me that if I average the fifth coordinate, I was going to get the same thing as if I average the first coordinate, right? That's just by symmetry, by permuting. No. What? This two is going to occur just as many times in the fifth place as it does in the first place. Yeah. Okay? By permuting. This one and the eight are going to occur just as many times in these two places as they would in these two places. By permuting. Two twos. Forget about the two twos. Okay? This one and this eight are going to occur just as many times in these two positions as they would in these two positions. Okay? Okay. I just did the permutation. It's just what you're doing is you're just permuting the whole the whole system. Yeah, but what if you have two twos, you screw everything up? No, it doesn't. <laughs> what do you mean, doesn't? Still with two A and two B. Doesn't matter. Okay. Just don't worry about that. I'm going to be really a bully and just say, forget about the twos. Okay? All right. What you do say is that the covariance between X1 and X1 is not the same. But this is not the same as the covariance between X1 and X1. Okay, which is the variance of x1. But you can't have x1, x1. There you go. That's the variance. Oh. Okay. So that's what you. That's what. That, this is probably the deepest part. Just using the symmetry of the sample space. This permutation, permuting idea. Okay. That I can permute and get back to. You know, just get back basically the group structure of the sample space. I just shift everybody around from one one mapping by doing permutation, okay? Of the sample space back to itself. Okay. 
Okay, so you'll see just as many pairs 1, 8 like this as you'll see pairs 1, 8 like that out of the 120 points. Okay, so the ex you know, okay. So the expectation of x1, x2 equals the expectation of x1, x3. Alright? And the covariance of x1, x2 equals the covariance of x1, x3. Okay. Also equals x2, x3. Because why? Yeah, it's the same as the variance of x the covariance of x2 and x3. Yeah, exactly. I just can't see that. They're all the same. Okay. So they're all the same. So in fact that gives you a trick as to actually how you can compute. This formula for the covariance is one of the, I did it in the notes, and it's also one of the homework problems, number 25. But the trick is this. You actually sample the whole population, and you calculate the variance of the sum. The sum of the 1, 2, 2, 4, and 8 is a constant for every sample of size 5. It's always 17. Okay? No matter how, what order I sample, right? For all the 120 samples, the sum of all of them is 17, right? Okay, so the variance is 17, the constant is 0. Okay, so 0 equals the variance of x1, I'm going to actually sample all of it, x5. Okay, and that though, can, we have a general formula for the variance of the sum. It's the, the sum of all the covariances. Where we have the n, we have covariance x1, x1, covariance x5, x5, and then all the other ones. Uh -huh. There are 5 times, there are n times, capital n times capital n minus 1 off diagonal covariances. And there are capital N diagonal covariances. So this is n variance x1 plus n n minus 1 covariance between x1 and x2. Okay? This is sigma squared. We call it the sigma sphere. Sigma squared is just what it is, a population variance. And this is something I'm going to, to be determined. And I get an equation for it. And it gives you that formula right there, the minus sign. So, question. So, the variance of x5, x5 equals the variance of x1, x1? Yeah. <sighs> okay. That's it. And that's the variance of the whole thing? Variance of the whole thing, or the trick I'm using here is that this variable, x1 plus x1 plus x5, is constant. It's constantly 17. Equals 17 identically. So 17 on every one of those 120 sample points. Mm -hmm. 17, 17, 17, 17, 17. So this variance is zero. Mm -hmm. Okay? And then I get this formula. Okay? N equals. So you're so, well, well, my question is, how did you get variance of x1 equals variance of x5? It's the same symmetry. Because you can switch. x1 and x5 have exactly the same distribution. x1 has distribution uh, 1, 2, 2, 4, and 8, probably one fifth each. Alright, x5 has the same exact distribution. But I can see why. But if you don't replace, x5 could be. X1 is has 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 probably distribution one fifth for one, two fifths for two, one fifth for four, and one fifth for eight. Uh -huh. That's it. X1 and X5. This is a the simple random sample is exchangeable. Every single variable has the same distribution. Every pair of variables has the same distribution. Every triplet of variables has the same distribution. Joint distribution. Every tuple of variables has exactly the same distribution. So I can, and also, it doesn't matter how many sam I sample, you know, if I want more stuff, I just sample them all, okay? Okay, so it's independent of how many I sample, clearly from the herd. But why is it, and times n minus 1 covariance? Okay, there's, there's, there's okay, there's, Capital N squared terms, 25 terms. I'm going to match an xi with an xj. All right. If if i is unequal to j, I'm using the covariance xi. Xj is equal to the covariance x1, x2. Okay. So there's 20 of those terms, and there's five diagonal terms. That got us to this page. Okay. <laughs> page three. Okay, actually we have all this good. So all the rest are just examples.
there's the finite, okay, how do you calculate the variance of x bar in there? Okay, what's the variance of x bar? This is almost the last calculation we need now. That will now be, just by formulas for variance, that's variance, let's just do the case of 2, right? x1 plus x2 divided by 2. So that's simply going to be 1 fourth times the variance of the sum. Now, I have not sampled all of the variables. I've only sampled two of them. But I know what the covariances are. So this is 1 fourth times sigma squared plus sigma squared plus every two covariance terms plus twice uh, the covariance between x1 and x2. So that comes out to be equal to, this is just going to give you the formula that you found, 2.34, right? This is the 1 fourth times uh, 2 times sigma squared plus 2, there's a sigma squared here, minus sigma squared over capital N minus 1. And if I actually um, follow this out, this is an N squared and this 2 is, a, well this 2 is, this is uh, well, i got to follow this out a little bit. So what does this actually come out to be, if I do this a little bit more carefully? What this comes out to be is, um, in general, then, if I take the variance of x bar of x1 plus so on plus little xn divided by little n, I get 1 over n squared times n times sigma squared plus little n times little n minus 1. Same idea times a minus sigma squared over a capital n minus 1. All right? And so I get that one of the n's cancel, the sigma squared scales up, sigma squared over n, I get 1 minus little n minus 1 over capital N minus 1. As opposed to the independent case where you don't have this extra factor. Capital N is infinity in the independent case. So that just becomes a factor of 1. So here's this finite population correction factor, FPC. So that's the only thing that's kind of, well, different in terms of calculation. And you saw that in your sample. In your problem, n was equal to 1. So the n was equal to 2. And so in your problem, this came out to be, for 7.1, this came out to be 6.24 over 2 times 1 minus 1 over 4 equals, that was 3 eighths times 6.24, which came out to be 2.34, I guess. Okay. 1.6 is 1.73 times. So that's the variance of. 0.78 times 3. 0.78 times 3. Expect a value? No, that's just the variance of x bar. What's x? X bar is a sample mean. Sample? Yes, yeah, sample mean. Good old sample mean. It's just that from a simple random sample now instead of an independent random sample. Each of the x, each of the component x's still has the same distribution. Okay, they're just not independent. Okay. So what would the distribution look like if you try? The x bar. We still have a central limit there. Okay, but we're going to use this for the variance. That's going to be the correction. All right. So when little, okay, little n should not be too small, because otherwise I won't be able to get a percent moment there. But capital N, and capital N should be pretty big, all right? And then if I still use this, if I use this approximate, I mean, if I use this as the variance, then I still get a central limit term. It's not too bad. So if I take capital N large and little over capital N small, but I still want that correction, then if I call this sigma squared sub x bar, and that's called the sample, the, the, that's the variance of x bar. It's just two notations for the variance of x bar. Then we're going to talk about sigma sub x bar equals the standard error of x bar. Okay, now that's going to, instead of calling it the standard deviation of x bar, 
even though it's exactly the same thing. We have two names for that, standard deviation of x-bar and standard error of x-bar. The reason that, and then you have this, and then you have the estimated standard error of x-bar. Or you replace <laughs> S of X bar <laughs> equals the effect. I, I probably even did it wrong in my notes number 17. Estimated standard error. Oh, X bar. So what's so there's there's a bunch of different stuff. What happens in in uh, is that people forget about calling it the estimated standard error, sometimes they just call it the standard error. And they're talking about the, the estimate of the variability of x bar you would get from the sample. Because what you're going to do is this is going to have a formula with sigma in it, the population variance. This one's going to have a formula with s in it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. The, s is the usual thing, the 1 over n minus 1, summation x i minus x bar squared. All right? The sample variance. S what? squared is the sample variance. So this is going to have a formula with s in it. Okay. So this is going to form it with sigma. So s sigma is the variant of a standard deviation of the sample. Sigma equals the population standard deviation. <laughs> and then what we're going to do is we're going to use this. It's just to stand for a standard deviation. Sigma will always stand for a standard deviation. But now x bar has a different standard deviation than x. Right? I had 10 numbers. There were 3 halves, 3 halves, 2, remember those? 3, 3, 9 halves, 5, 5, 6, uh -huh. whatever. Those are the values of x bar. Yeah. Okay. That is a different standard deviation. Uh -huh. Just calculate it. Yeah. We did. Okay. I believe. What's uh -huh. all these calculations That's you've been doing today? Of, yeah. Okay. We calculated that. All right? Well, what's That's the a standard, you know, we call it standard error of x bar. Uh -huh. Because instead of calling it the standard deviation of x bar, this thing we're suddenly calling it standard error. Okay? Instead of standard deviation. Why? I don't know. It's just that you want to differentiate it from the sigma. Okay? So you give it a different name. But what's this? S of what do you S of x bar is one. This is actually going to have a formula. This has this formula right here. It's just the square root of that. Uh -huh. Equals the square root. Uh, we go sigma over the square root of n times this finite population factor, mm -hmm. square root. Okay, a little epsilon change. Okay? So basically it looks like sigma by the root of n. All right? This is um, s, okay, over the square root of n. Then it has a different thing, 1 minus n over capital N. It comes out, where s squared is 1 over n minus 1, the usual thing. He calls it little x, s squared in this chapter, whereas he called it capital S squared in the previous chapter. Okay, he calls it little s squared here because that's more common. He used capital S squared in the previous chapter because he wanted to emphasize that it was a random variable. But at little s squared is the more common notation for it. The reason is that usually, Usually the difference is capital S squared will represent the random variable. Little s squared will actually represent the sample value of the random variable. One of the numbers you actually see. It's not a random variable anymore. Okay? That's the use of the little s squared. And why is it called estimated? No. Estimated standard error? Because um, this is standard error. It's actually with the sigma. It's the actual standard deviation of x bar. Uh -huh. The actual real standard deviation. I calculated it. Okay? using the actual uh -huh. populations and so on, okay? So this is used by the This sample. is estimated. I don't know. Let's say I don't know what the population is. Mm -hmm. I don't know the population parameter sigma, mm -hmm. okay? Then I use the S, the sample, the sample number, in place of the sigma. S in place of sigma. Sigma is a, is a Greek S, okay? <laughs> right? So I'm using S in place of sigma. That's all that's being done here. Tina, um, here we should do you finish. Now or not? Uh, if you need another hour or something, go for it. You know, if you can't, if you want to do it, you know, we'll oh, be nice. turning today by oh, 5:30. Okay. okay, maybe we should be done with this. What I'm going to discuss next time is a little bit of talk about uh, the dichotomous case. So what there are is a whole slew of formulas here. Please bear with it.
I've tried to explain as much as I could right today. All right? But the examples are pretty clear. The only difficulty is sometimes it's ignoring the finite population correction, and sometimes not. And certain problems will say, I'll just ignore this, because you don't have the population size. So you have to ignore it. Okay, in other problems, he actually gives you the population size, but then you don't ignore it. Okay. Uh, okay. That's basically so the S is the sample standard deviation. <laughs> yes. What? And then you have the population standard deviation, which is the sigma. If I actually have the population. Uh, right, right, right. Okay, very good. That was, I know that was torturous. It is, because it's just so many things to keep track of. Thank you very much. Sorry, right, both. To affect the response, which was uh, the time to stock the cases at the pop machine or what have you, okay? So it was, it was uh, let's see, I forgot how many data points there were in that set. But I guess you can see from, yes, it was 25. So this was uh, 25 by 3. Okay. And then the Y was just, let's go ahead and put in the, uh, the delivery times in minutes. Okay. So if you actually look at the Maple worksheet, what I started doing is I put in the first row, the second row, the third row, the fourth row, the fifth row, and so on uh, of, of a matrix. Okay, that was the way I put it in in Maple. If you're, if you're not familiar with Maple, maybe just sort of look at the displays and the formulas. The formula should be kind of clear, all right? So I'm writing out uh, using typewriter symbols, okay, which don't have primes and things like that <laughs> uh, so easily uh, so that it won't interact with the actual syntax of the language. Maple language, um, an obvious notation for the calculations we have to do to, to solve the normal equations. Okay, so how, how do I solve these normal equations? So now I claim I have the normal equations as follows. They are written finally as x prime, and actually you'll see this, this is a lecture right out of the linear algebra course. X prime times y minus x beta. And I'll put the hat on it now, okay? Equal to 0, 0. This is a k plus 1 by 1 matrix, 0. Okay, so x prime is 3 by 25. Y is 25 by 1, so th this is a, what, x prime y is a 3 by 1, corresponding to this being three zeros. Maybe I'll just go put three zeros in here in this delivery time case, all right? K is equal to 2. So I'm getting three zeros. This three parameters to solve for. Beta zero hat, beta one hat, beta two hat. Three equations and three unknowns. Beta zero hat, beta one hat, beta two hat. Okay. So I can go ahead and multiply that out, and I get x prime y equals x prime x beta hat. And this is exactly what you had before. Remember on the very first day, which was only a little while ago, we had this formula, we had it written as the following, x prime x, which was a square matrix involving an n in the upper left hand corner, summation xi is on the off diagonal, and summation xi squared on the main diagonal, okay, equal to, and then times beta zero, beta zero hat, beta one hat, equal to summation yi, summation xi yi. There's a summation yi because the first row of x prime is once, right? So this is exactly the analog, and so we could actually write down what x prime x looks like in terms of um, products. Uh, x prime x, in fact, is x prime x is in fact 
1 prime 1, 1 prime x1, 1 prime x2, and so on, 1 prime xk. So that would be all the sum summation xi1, summation xi2, summation xik. You can think of it, it, hopefully in your imagination you can see this. Okay? Are you talking like the inner products there? Hmm? Yeah, well, those are actually products because one is a horizontal matrix oh, and one yeah, is a I vertical. See the transpose, yeah, sorry. transpose. Okay? And so on. And so it's, it's basically, it's, it's uh, and then it's um, um, x1 prime 1, uh, x1 prime x1, x1 prime x2, x1 prime x k. All right, so those are products, summation xi1, summation xi1, xi2, xi1, 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 xi2, summation xi1, xik. So you're getting mixed products, right? And so on. So you can imagine this whole array of summation xi, J X I L or something. Okay, X I. So the whole thing looks like summation X I J X I. <coughs> Maybe we'll put an uh, L or something like that. Okay, J and L going from zero up to K. All right, uh, where X I zero would be one. X I zero equals 1 for all i equals 1 to n. Okay, so that would be one way to think of this matrix. It looks like that, J, L. Okay? That's what the x prime x matrix is, if you wanted to do it by hand. Okay? <laughs> so, uh, you think of it as, what I think of it is is as follows. I take, okay, to get the uh, 2, 3 entry of x prime x, um, I take this, this second column and the third column, I take the inner product, just the inner product of columns. So it's this column into this column, this column to this column, blah, blah, blah. Okay? And it's symmetric. Okay? Okay. So that's the X prime X matrix. And the upper left hand corner is the number of observations. So that's 25 in this case. 1 prime 1, which is n. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I have this nice normal equation. How do I solve it? Well, I think we just take the inverse. So here's where I'm not going I'm to, I'm going to stop with formulas. I'm just going to go to the inverse matrix and say, okay, we have beautiful packages for computing inverses. We have Gauss elimination. Let somebody else do it. Okay? <laughs> Let somebody else do it instead of coming up with formulas. You can't. You can't come up with formulas. There's ways to do it. But we're just going to punt, so to speak. So we must be we're almost run out of time, right? Because we need to take the break. But let's just go ahead and get the equation. Let's take a couple more linear algebra theorems. Did we start just a little bit late today? So we still have a minute? OK. You have eight minutes of tape left. All right. All right. <laughs> what w what will we need to know? A little review of linear algebra. A little quiz. What do we need to know in order to make this matrix invertible? This is a square matrix. It's a three by three matrix, which, I, which uh, we did write explicitly on this maple sheet here. Determinant okay. Non Determinant non-zero. Another condition. Does there must, I think in your linear algebra text, aren't there like? A, B, C through Z, okay? Equivalent conditions? <laughs> Something like that. The key, uh, we have a text here in the department we've been using, and it keeps repeating the same theorem and adding conditions that are equivalent throughout the whole course. It's kind of humorous. Uh, after the row, row reduced echelon form has no rows of zeros. Okay. Well, I want to do it in terms of rank. Remember that good stuff? Linear independence and all that? The rank of this matrix is a dimension of the column space. 
which is also the dimension of the row space, as you know from the re, uh, the row the uh, row redu reduction theory. Okay, because the uh, rank doesn't change upon row reduction. Okay. So you have to pick your x's carefully. Well, yeah, I mean the x is if 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 two if one x is is a constant multiple of the other. Okay, then you actually don't have full rank, right? I mean, you have, you don't have linearly independent columns. So the rank is the dimension of the column space of this matrix. That's the easiest formula for it. And that's going to match with this because I'm focusing on those columns, those regressors plus the intercept. All right. So as long as they're linearly independent, we have the rank is k plus one. All right. What I need for this to be invertible is for this rank to be full. The square matrix has to have full rank to be invertible. So it has to have rank k plus one to be invertible. And that's what I want. I'm going to assume that. I know there's a lot of, there are some interesting uh, texts out there, some in fact which I've taught out of, where they really go into a whole scheme of what if it's not full rank and so on, and generalized inverses and all this good stuff. It's beautiful, but it's going to take us too far afield to go into that. So I just make the note of that. Uh, if you go into a PhD program in statistics, you're probably going to have to know what a generalized inverse is. <laughs> but we're not going to do it here. Dimension of the column space of x. So um, if uh, dimension of x is equal to k plus 1, well, well, and also know that dimension of x, also dimension of x is equal to the dimension of x prime x. That's a theorem from linear algebra. Okay. So uh, if the columns are linearly independent, so if columns of x are linearly independent, then um, uh, x prime x is invertible. Yes? So like, say for example, you did some sort of experiment, you came up with this, this type of situation and you're trying to solve this, and you found out that, say that, you know, one one of the x's was a linear combination of the others. Yes. Would you then be able to jump back up to your thing and say, okay, I've got too many, uh, I, don't need, I don't need this many. That's correct. You would just get rid of one of them. It would, it would make the interpretation more difficult. But in terms of uh, making the analysis, you, could, you would just eliminate the linear dependencies. Yeah, that's one way to do it. And uh, short of that, again, you could get into the generalized inverse theory. Okay? You still, there's a couple ways to go there. One is go to notice it. One is to go back and see. It's modifying well, yeah, you could, well, you could add more x variables. You could make a bigger design, in other words. Um, well, you, could, you, could, you, could, you could try to eliminate the uh, dependencies in the x's in some way. That would be another alternative. But uh, you would want to note that uh, multicollinearity happening, OK? And then deal with it somehow. But if you kind of like an indicator that maybe your your choice for your uh, normal equation or whatever wasn't, wasn't right, maybe is that the, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that the only? The normal equations are OK. Normal, you get to choose the x, so it just means that we did a bad experiment. You have too many, okay, the regressors, yeah, you would have too many regressors in that case. You have a dependence among the regressors, so they're, they're interlinked and so on. The only problem is you take one out, uh, interpretation, you just have to play with the interpretation. So it's just a, it's just a uh, problem of the context. 
right? You have uh, interrelated variables, and uh, you have to sort of choose a basis in which you want to make the interpretation. Which ones do you want to choose? You're going to say heart rate is an exact linear function of, of uh, some other medical quantities, all right? Then you would write that off on the side, okay? Probably. And don't, you know, and then choose which variables you want to put in your formula. We'll get into that a little bit more, okay? We'll study it just a little bit. So I want to discuss the uh, full rank case then, where they're invertible. X prime x is invertible. Then we can write the solution to the normal equation. Okay? Because now that's an invertible matrix. And then you simply get beta hat equals x prime x inverse x prime y. Okay. Now what's the prediction there for? Prediction is y hat equals x beta hat. That's your predicted vector. All right, because it's just you're putting in beta hat instead of beta. One minute. So then you sim simply get that this is x times x prime x inverse x prime y, which we're going to call h y. H is a nice. That's actually the projection matrix. Projecting the projection onto the column space of x projects y onto column space of x. Let's quit here. We'll pick it up.